satellite network affiliates. Spanning the world. Your connection to the world's best. Presents the Seminar Link. Today from Salt Lake City, Utah, to Portland, Oregon, to Kansas City, Missouri. Presenting live, Mr. J.W. Mitten, lawsuit and asset protection expert, a man who's now teaching thousands how to create their financial fortress. And yours truly, Lloyd Newell. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is very nice. Well, I am excited about being here this evening because I think we're all in for an excellent education on how to keep what we're working so hard to get. Are you all interested in that? Yeah. I know I am. All right, great. As you know, we're meeting together tonight in three different locations. We have a group here in Salt Lake City, all of this fine-looking bunch here, and a group in Portland where I understand the big storm has stopped and the skies have cleared. And there's a big group in Kansas City where I hear it was nice and sunny today. Here in Salt Lake, the skies have been a bit cloudy and they say a sto uh, storm is on the way. But right now, everything looks perfect for our seminar, seminar Link production tonight. We want to welcome all of you to this excellent Seminar Link program. Just out of curiosity, how many of you people here in Salt Lake City have ever been concerned about being sued? Anybody ever thought about yeah. it? <laughs> all right, most of us have. How about you folks in Portland? Let's hear from you. Have you ever thought about being sued? <laughs> Some laughs like Lloyd, that's an obvious question. And how about you folks in Kansas City? Have you ever thought about it? Kansas City sounds like they've thought about it more than anybody else here tonight. Well, I have a feeling you just might think a little bit more seriously about lawsuits after you hear what our speaker, Jay Mitten, has to say about the subject during the next few hours. Satellite Network Affiliates is very pleased to bring you this outstanding seminar link presentation this evening. And we hope you like the fact that it's coming right to your area. There's no air travel, there's no hotels, Nothing involved, uh, it's meant to be convenient for you, and we want to make the whole SNA experience as enjoyable and informational as possible. And for that purpose, you'll find a green evaluation form in your seminar packet tonight. If you look through your packet, you'll find that. This questionnaire will greatly help us to better serve you in the future, so please take just a moment to fill it out before leaving the seminar. An SNA representative will be happy to take your completed form at the door as you exit. We really do appreciate your cooperation with this because we want your feedback. We'd like to hear from everybody. You may not be aware of the fact that SNA is establishing the seminar link in communities all over the country. We're currently planning a series of permanent downlink sites and facilities for seminars just like this one. So you'll be able to see the finest and most sought after speakers in the world right there in your own city. It's a wonderful concept and you're going to find out just how wonderful it truly is right here tonight as you learn more about asset protection from expert J.W. Mitten. J. Mitten holds both a master's degree in business administration and a Juris Doctorate degree. He is broadly considered to be the nation's leading authority on lawsuit and tax protection. His seminars are in constant demand by the medical, dental, business, and civic communities, teaching thousands of people each year how to keep it and how to protect it. J. is often referred to as the professional's professional. Having been very successful in helping the wealthy to protect their assets, reduce their income taxes, and to avoid probate, he's the author of many popular books, including Keeping It, Total Financial Protection, and Building Your Financial Fortress. He's also a regular contributor to Tax Tips, that's a syndicated newspaper column, as well as to numerous financial magazines. In fact, listen to a couple of these comments that I, I brought along. After attending Jay's seminar, Jeff Verdon, a tax attorney from Newport Beach, California, had this to say about Jay. Jay Mitten has truly found the solution to this country's lawsuit crisis. In 10 years practicing as a tax attorney, I have never been so impressed with another colleague's ideas and creativity as I have been with those of Mr. Mitten's lawsuit protection strategies. Or how about this, from nationally acclaimed legal author Charles F. Abbott, he writes this. In my opinion, Jay Mitten's protection plan is the safest, most effective program ever developed for safeguarding a person's assets from creditors. Equally as important, it's easy for a non-lawyer to understand and implement. 
Jay says his clients are usually shocked to find out that there are simple steps they could have taken to protect themselves. And because you're attending tonight's seminar, you won't be one of those shocked people. Well, tonight you'll learn how to use trusts, corporations, and partnerships to successfully build and protect your estate from lawsuits. You'll also learn how to keep more of your money by reducing your income, state, and inheritance taxes. I'm sure we're all interested in that. So let's get started, shall we? Please join me in welcoming author, consultant, and successful attorney, America's leading lawsuit and asset protection expert, Mr. J. W. Mitten. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be with you tonight. I would like you to take, if you will, a look at the screen in front of you because it demonstrates something that each one of us needs to know. You and I, each one of us, spends a lifetime accumulating our assets. You build your financial fortress. I don't care whether you have a $20,000 estate, a $20 million estate. There are three cruise missiles headed your way that can wipe out much of that which we have accumulated. Now, as you look at the screen, notice you got the cruise missile lawsuits. The average American, incidentally, according to a new study, is sued five times during his or her lifetime. Many people find themselves losing it all on that point. Number two, you've got the cruise missile of income taxes. Many of us lose it all because of improper income tax planning or because we are liable for somebody else's income taxes. Number three, if you look at the estate tax cruise missile, a death occurs and often we see families lose substantial portions of their assets, if not all their assets, because they failed to comply with a few basic rules. Now, I need your help tonight. What I'd like you to do is tell me which of these three subjects you want to have the greatest emphasis on here this evening. Now, I'm going to do that by applause, all right? Now, what I want to do is ask you which of the three, I'll name them one by one, and then you tell me by applause, which of these three subjects you would like to spend the greater amount of time on here this evening, okay? So subject number one, lawsuit and asset protection. How many want to spend the majority of t the time on that one tonight? Okay. All right, thank you. Now subject number two, income taxes. Okay, thank, thank you. Now subject number three, which would be advanced estate planning. Well, thank you. You've been no help at all. It looked to me, uh, actually it looked to me if I were judging it, about 65% of you, a little heavier on number one. So I'm going to focus just a little heavier emphasis on subject number one, but I will not ignore subject two and subject three. We're still going to hit them. Now, before I dive into what, do any of you have any specific questions, problems? You know, as a neighbor, as a partner, as an associate said, get an answer to this question, get an answer to that question tonight. If you do, let me take some questions right now from all three of our audiences so that we can find out where you want me to focus in on some specific questions that you might have, okay? So to Salt Lake City, do we have any questions here, things that I can help answer, weave into the fabric of tonight's meeting? Yes, sir, we have a question over here. Now, living in such a litigious society, I'm concerned about how I can protect my house from the, my creditors and from the IRS. Okay, gentlemen, is concerned about how do you protect the house, lawsuits, liens, those kinds of things. Let me tell you this. You avoid doing what almost everybody in this audience, all three audiences, in fact, have done tonight, which is you have your homes in joint tenancy, joint ownership. One of the most lethal, one of the most dangerous things ever created with regard to that home. Listen carefully when I move you to tool number one and tool number six. Those are the greatest two tools in America in advanced asset protection for the home. Thank you for the question. We will focus in for you on that one. Now, from Portland, do we have any questions from Portland? There's things you'd like us to focus in on, please. Okay, we're having some potential audio connection problems there. Let's try Kansas City. Kansas City, do you have some specific questions you'd like me to be sure and weave in tonight? And then we'll come back to Portland momentarily. Yes, Jay, I'd like you to comment on Howard Ruff's uh, opinion that uh, lawsuits can be um, more easily um, affected in certain states that are more liberal toward attacking trusts. 
and in those trusts, um, Howard Mann recommends that you have to get out of the United States to uh, form a trust, for example, on the Isle of Man to uh, protect your assets fully. You've got to be very, very careful. Certain kinds of trusts give you very little protection. Other kinds of trusts give you sensational lawsuit protection. But you've got to be very careful. One of the fatal mistakes many people make is they go offshore thinking that they've insulated their assets. But I'm going to tell you right now, you put your assets in an offshore trust or an Alamand trust right this minute, and those assets are in Portland or Kansas City or Salt Lake City, and within 15 minutes, I will have your assets frozen. Offshore trusts have some advantages, but only as to the assets, assets which you have shifted offshore. So be careful on that one. Sometimes a little bit of knowledge can create some serious problems. Okay, let's go back to Salt Lake City. All right, any questions? Salt Lake City now. Yes, uh, we're in the process of forming a small company that uh, does business with a, with a general public. And uh, we're concerned about uh, lawsuits that could uh, affect not just the business, but also our, our personal assets. Okay, you've, you've correctly outlined one of the most dangerous things in America, and that is if you have any kind of a business, not only do you have at risk those business assets, which we're going to show you basically how you insulate with certain kinds of corporate level tools, but you also have at risk the home, the personal assets, the bank accounts, the stocks, the bonds, and even your individual retirement accounts. You cannot believe how many people lose their retirement accounts. You spend a lifetime salting away those monies and often lose it in lawsuits, certain kinds of liens. Yes, so we'll focus in a little heavier for you on that one. Pay attention to the last 15 minutes of tonight's meeting where we go into detail on how you structure business and personal interrelationships. We'll go through that one specifically. Okay, back to Portland. Do we have a question from Portland now? Hello, I think you can maybe hear us better this time. Yes, I... I had spoke earlier and I had lost my property even though we had a family trust when my husband was injured we still had a creditors attacking it even when we filed bankruptcy how could I have protected it yeah, that's one of the fatal misunderstandings in America just as another questioner asked a moment ago which is too many people think if you have a living trust you've insulated your assets let me clarify there probably is not one living trust out of a thousand living trusts in the entire United States that insulate and protect assets one out of a thousand may protect, 999 will not. So that's the fallacy that many have. In fact, if I sued you right now, I'd be thrilled if you had a trust because I'll go right through the trust and seize those assets. You have to move to the advanced tools now. Hang on when I come to tool number six. Take some pretty good notes, and maybe the second time around, you're gonna have some pretty good protection. So hang on with me, we'll be there shortly, okay? Okay, we have a question for Kansas City now. Yes, Jay. Uh my, pro or my income, rather, is in the process of quadrupling, and I need some in income tax help. Yeah, well, you have my sympathies. <laughs> okay, you need some income tax help, right? If your income is quadrupling, the thing you need to do is see that tax attorney, that accountant, somebody who is experienced. You don't see a tax preparer. You see a tax advisor. There is a difference. Now, when you see a tax advisor, you're going to find that they're going to structure for you certain things to do at that business level. They're going to talk about corporations and business trust, children's trust. Tune in for the last 15 minutes of tonight's seminar. I'll give you some of those ways. And then they're going to focus in at the personal level, some of the exciting things you can do, like spreading income to the family. I'll show you some of the most popularly used techniques in America that are in the legal and in the white area of the tax law. Thank you. Okay, well, that gives us a pretty good focus. Any others now before we dive in? All right. Thank you very much. Let's now go to the subject of number one, lawsuits. What are some basic things that I need to do to protect myself and my assets? Let's become aware, first of all, of the sources, how they sneak up on us. They hit us from the side, from the rear. Now let's go through them one by one. Number one. 51.2% of all marriages end in divorce. And I'll tell you folks, there are some people taking advantage of in the divorce setting because of the superior knowledge of the attorney who represents the other spouse. Listen to tool number six, if that is of concern. But remember, divorce is a legal action. It is often a combatant of two different attorneys with varying degrees of experience and expertise. Listen to tool number six in a few moments. Let's go to number two, employee actions. One of the things you've got to be very, very careful about, at least I tell my clients, is this. If you have one employee or more, you have absolutely no choice whatsoever. Your business, your profession will be incorporated. 
You know, we had a group of doctors the other day, five doctors, sent their secretary out to buy a hot dog for him lunchtime. She zips out of the driveway in her uninsured automobile, clips the leg of a university jogger who just happens to be jogging by the wrong driveway at the wrong time. The guy's out of the jogging business now just a little over six months, and the Supreme Court just recently affirmed a judgment against the five doctors for $1.2 million. Be careful. The rule which is fixed and immutable with my clients is if you have one employee or more, you incorporate that business or that profession. Now number three, guest accidents at home. You're already aware of this. Somebody coming on the premises, a salesman, an uninvited guest, or even an invited guest, an accident occurs at the home and you know full well what can happen to you. In fact, slipping on the porch of a frozen porch the other day results in a $600,000 lawsuit be careful. Guess accidents at home, you have to be aware that one of the things you've got to have is your liability insurance, but don't overlook the most overlooked liability insurance in America, which is an umbrella liability policy. All right, let's go to number four. Joint ownership. Now, I know, as I stand here before all three of you, in Salt Lake, Portland, Kansas City, each of you tuning in right now, husband and wives, I'm going to tell you how 99.9% .9 of you hold title to your assets. You have your assets in joint ownership. The most fatal mistake in America from a lawsuit standpoint, I permit no client to use joint ownership. You see, the reason is this. If you use joint ownership and then one spouse gets sued, often you lose 100% of the assets held the joint ownership. So be cautious of joint ownership. If you ever move to one of our nine community property states, be cautious of community property, which has similar disadvantages and tenancy by the entireties, similar disadvantages. Incidentally, let me pass on a thought to you. The US Supreme Court just a few months ago, in fact, it was five years ago, June 26, 1985, the United States Supreme Court handed down one of the most lethal decisions in America on the subject of joint ownership. On that date, the United States Supreme Court for the first time in history ruled that if mother or dad put a son or daughter's name on their properties, on their real estate, their stocks, their bonds, and incidentally, you often do that so that if a death occurs, the estate goes without probate to the children, so I understand why you do it. But if you do it, the United States Supreme Court has now ruled it is the law of the land that the creditor of mother or dad, may, of the creditor of the son that is, may now seize the assets of mother and dad. So be cautious about putting a child, a neighbor, a friend, a cousin, niece, nephew, whatever. Be cautious about putting their names ever on your bank accounts, your stocks, your bonds. That is one of the big pitfalls in America. Let's go to number five. Involvement in partnerships. Now this sounds maybe anti-American, but be cautious. I tell my clients, don't you dare get involved in general partnerships, even if it isn't writing. You avoid general partnerships like the plague. Be cautious about unwritten joint ventures because too many people lose their assets by being involved in a general partnership because of the act of one partner. As an illustration, we had 15 doctors just recently, four or five of them, had attended a seminar, how to get rich in real estate, how to multiply your earnings and your wealth through leveraging into real estate. 15 doctors. One of the 15 has a $2 million net worth. The other 14, fairly new into the profession, no substantial net worth. Something goes wrong the other day, and they are now facing $5 million in judgments and lawsuits. And you know who they're coming after. The gentleman in my office the other day, along with his accountant, was doctor number 15. The one with the $2 million estate, panic-stricken, because on him comes the full weight of the $5 million of lawsuits. Folks, be careful. I'm going to warn you right now. If you are in a general partnership of any kind this very minute, if you are involved in any kind of an unwritten joint venture, if I could order you, I'd order you to see your attorney. You see that attorney tomorrow, and incidentally, that attorney is going to now convert that general partnership into one of two things. Number one, perhaps a corporation. And number two, a very rare partnership called the limited partnership. Right, let's go to number six. Be careful about serving as a corporate officer or director. I mean, I plead with you, be cautious. I've seen too many people. Lose it all on that. In fact, just the other day, Brownsville, Texas, a gal came up to me and said, Jay, she said, my husband and I were each invited to serve on the board of directors of one of our now-filled banks. 
She said, Jay, we had nothing to do with the failure of that bank. It was not our fault. We attended the monthly director's meetings, collected our $100 a month director's allowance. But she said, Jay, my husband is being sued for $150 million today. And Jay, I am also being sued for $150 million, $300 million in lawsuits. Be cautious about serving as officers or directors of corporations, even of charitable corporations. Now, if you are going to serve as a director or an officer of a corporation, you just so insist, then I would encourage you to see your attorney tomorrow and you get your attorney's written permission for you to serve on that board of directors, for you to serve as an officer of a corporation. That's how lethal, I think, this kind of service can be for too many of us. Let's go to number seven. A suit today for something that occurred perhaps 10 years ago. Do you know you cannot even retire and get out from under the potential of the lawsuit mania that you may have created for yourself? In fact, in Washington, D.C., the other day at a medical convention, I had a doctor come up to me and he said, Jay, he said, my partner retired this year. He just had it with escalating malpractice alert rates, escalating premium rates, exposure, he retires. In fact, he retires 15 years early to get up under the pressure. Oh, incidentally. First year into retirement, this doctor's partner gets nailed with a $5 million lawsuit for a delivery. He had assisted another doctor with 20 years previously. Notwithstanding statute of limitations, we become vulnerable for things we do today, perhaps 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now. In fact, I have a neighbor just a few houses from my home now who at age 74 is now a former millionaire just last year, lost his home, his bank account stocks, but lost every single thing he has owned. He is now in a little rental home, trying to live on Social Security, trying to insulate what remains of his Social Security. Oh, his mistake? His mistake is the same thing that many of us are exposed to, which is he was involved in a business transaction some 21 years ago for which he is now held liable all these many years later. Be careful, folks. Too many of us think that just because we have forgotten about that potential liability situation, that our creditors have forgotten about it. I got news for you. They may not have so done. Let's go to number eight. Just owning an asset can be dangerous. And you're going to say, gee, that sounds strange. What do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. If I file suit, against each one of you tonight in Portland and Kansas City and Salt Lake City. I file suit against you. Let's say I file suit against you tomorrow morning. Let me tell you what I'm hoping. Now, you won't want to hear this, but let me tell you what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that you have placed all of your assets in Mother and Dad's names because when I sue you, that is so simple to seize your assets. Oh, do you know what I'm also hoping? As we've heard in two of the questions here tonight. I'm hoping that you've attended 15 seminars on estate planning. I'm hoping you have set up your living trust because when I file suit against you, I'm going to seize the assets in your living trust. And some of you are going to say, now, wait a minute, Jay. Well, wait a minute, Jay. I don't have just a normal revocable living trust. Why, I have an irrevocable living trust. You know, I have never seen a correctly drafted irrevocable trust in my lifetime flowing through one of my law offices. If they violate one or more four major rules, the courts allow the creditors to seize the assets in your irrevocable trust. The biggest mistake in America on that one, incidentally, in case I forget to mention it to you later, be careful who the trustee is if you choose to be involved in an irrevocable trust. So do you see the concept? And incidentally, getting back to one of the questions a minute ago, if I filed suit against you tomorrow morning, I would be thrilled if you have placed your assets into an offshore trust, the Alaman Trust, the Cayman Islands Trust. I would be thrilled because I am going to freeze your assets within 15 to 30 minutes of me filing the lawsuit against you. The thing you must learn tonight as we go through the tools are how do I hold title in the multiple kinds of legal ent entities available to us? We'll be into that shortly. OK, let's go to number nine. This is one of the rapidly growing areas in law. And that's this. You're not an officer. You are not a director of any corporation in America. But you look and act as though you might be a director or an officer. And now you can be held liable as an implied officer of a corporation. That is one of the growing areas in law. You say, my gosh, that doesn't sound right, Jay. How can that be? 
I was in Orlando, Florida just the other day. I had a guy come up to me there and she said, Jay, she said, I'm not an officer. I'm not a director of any corporation in America, but I got a friend who has a company. And she said, every so often, my friend goes on vacations. He said, I just go in as a courtesy to him. I sign some checks, pay a few bills. Just to lend a helping hand to him, she said, Jay, the other day, his corporation got sued. They went right through the corporation, seized the corporate assets. Corporation files for bankruptcy. Each of the officers, each of the directors files for bankruptcy. Then she said, Jay, they then subpoenaed copies of the corporate financial records, including canceled checks. And she said, Jay, they found a few checks bearing my signature that, you know, just occasionally when I went on the vacation, I'd sign those few checks just as that courtesy for my friend. She said, Jay, I lost my $2 million estate, everything, because the court held me to be an implied treasurer. Folks, it's how you look often in your business dealings that creates the liabilities. Not because you have just hit the letter of the law. Sometimes that spirit of the law can know you and they'll too many of us. Let's go to number 10. Another source of problem for many of us is this, and, and I don't want to appear anti-insurance. I'm not. I firmly believe in insurance. I have insurance and encourage my clients to have insurance, but you better realize that starting in the state of California, this thing has spread nationally, which is immense pressure on the insurance companies to lower their rates or at least to lessen or lower the acceleration of their rates. Many insurance companies are responding brilliantly, articulately, by building in escape clauses to their policies. In fact, in New York City the other day, I flipped over the Hertz rent car contract. I wanted to see how things have changed since I was last there. There on the Hertz rent car contract, it showed something kind of interesting. It said, if the wheels of the automobile ever touch a dirt road, the insurance is gone. We had into our office the other day come a former fairly successful dairy farmer. This dairy rancher said, Jay, I had a little haystack worth $100, catches on fire, burns to the ground. The flames leap 35 feet over, burn down a $375,000 dairy barn with his milking cows, his equipment inside. He receives a check in the mail the other day. And you'll be shocked for how much. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking he gets a check for $100. I'm pleased to report he does not get a check for $100. The policy is $50 deductible. He gets a check for $50 for full satisfaction. Do you see what I'm saying? Exceptions are being built into policies, the likes of which I have never seen before, at least in the history of my, of my law practice. Let's go to number 11. Advisory board members. Be on guard here. This is something we would not have talked about five years ago. We have to talk about it today. You cannot believe how many people just in an advisory capacity are being nailed. You're almost to the point that if somebody asks you a financial and investment question, you want to ponder for 15 hours before you dare respond. Advisory board member, in fact, in Oklahoma City the other day, one of their hospitals folds. And in the process of folding, there's $200,000 in back payroll taxes owed to the Internal Revenue Service. And yes, you guessed it. The Internal Revenue Service files a lien against each of the officers of the hospital, each of the directors of the hospital, and then the shocker. They filed a $200,000 tax lien against the eight advisory board members, advisors. All right. Well, we've got enough of the exposure. You realize how many ways these things can strike us from so many different sources. Let's talk now for a few minutes about some basic solutions. In fact, I had a call the other day from the largest, most widely read newspaper in America. They said, Jay, can you boil down to five things, the five key points that every businessman and every professional must know in asset protection. Now, many of you have read it in your local papers, but let me give you now those five key points that we just simply must be aware of by way of basic solutions. Number one, beware of joint tenancy, tenancy by the entireties and community ownership. So the rule with my clients is absolutely fixed and immutable, which is you must never touch any form of joint tenancy or tenancy by the entireties or community ownership the rest of your lifetime. It is that serious in America. Be cautious. Now number two, use corporations wisely. 
I've already alluded to one of these, but you look at point A, 2A. I use corporations with my clients if there are one or more employees inside of that association. You must consider incorporating one or more employees. In fact, you saw in the newspaper the other day, this, I mean, this is kind of a, a tragic situation for those involved, but you saw a 250-man law firm file for bankruptcy. I had a 100-man law firm the other day from the New York area call me, panic-stricken because one of the attorneys has committed a major malpractice. I've got 100 attorneys panic-stricken in that law firm and out of northern Florida the other day get a telephone call from one of our large accounting firms in America where they are panic-stricken because in the Midwest one of the accounting, accounting offices has committed a major malpractice facing millions of dollars in lawsuits. You must realize the rule is simple. If you have one employee or more, you incorporate, and number two, if there are two or more partners, associates, two of you in any kind of a business or profession, the rule with my clients is you must incorporate and you incorporate immediately. Now let's move you to number three. We alluded to this a few moments ago, but I feel very, very strongly that every American family must consider doing what 95% of us do not do, which is you must consider a little policy that wraps around your homeowners, wraps around the vehicle policy. It is called the umbrella liability insurance. Now, if you don't have it, see your agent tomorrow. You know, get it soon. Number four, share your assets. This is the day and age when you need to share ownership with the family. But I tell my clients, you don't share control. There are certain partnerships, certain kinds of trusts that you and I can set up. Literally, if I wanted to, I could transfer 100% of my assets into certain legal tools, which are owned by my wife and my children, and yet Jay Mitten could have zero ownership, but 100% control. Now, we'll go through some of those tools with you shortly. Now, let's move to point number five in lawsuit solutions. And that is, we must be aware of the proper kinds of asset ownership. That means if it is so dangerous to have assets in dad's name or mother's name, it's so dangerous to put the assets in joint ownership, community property, tenancy by the entireties, and how on earth do we hold title to the assets if we want advanced asset protection? There are two major tools. Now listen closely, the precise words. Number one, there are certain kinds of living trusts. We've already heard here tonight, people have lost their assets because they used the improper kinds of living trust. We will now talk about the right kinds of trust to use. And number two, we will talk about the proper kinds of limited partnerships that can be utilized in advanced asset protection. So in part two of our meeting coming up shortly, notice particular tool number one and tool number six. Okay, let's now move to a second overview subject, the income tax area. Let me just go over a few things with you now on the subject of income taxes. Number one, this is one of the big problems in America. It is called vicarious liability. That means that somebody else owes the income taxes, but you must pay. Now, get this in the notes. Please, too many lose it by lack of awareness of this problem. Do you realize what we're saying? You're innocent, but you go broke because you must pay someone else's income taxes. Now, it often happens, point number one, when you receive a telephone call from brother, sister, aunt, uncle, next door neighbor, friend, relative, they call you one day and they say, hey, I'm setting up a corporation. I'd like to invite you to be on the board of directors of that corporation. Now, I tell my clients, you don't even have to think about the answer to that question, because the answer is an automatic what? No. Well, no thank you works also, folks, okay? <laughs> but you got the point. Be careful. In fact, in Anchorage, Alaska the other day, a father-in-law says yes when he should have said no. His son-in-law calls him from Anchorage and says, hey, Dad, would you mind serving on my board of directors? I need somebody who has the initials MD behind their name. It adds, you know, it adds credibility to my corporation. Dad said, okay, son-in-law, I'll be glad to serve on your board of directors. I don't have time to attend the meetings. I will not be involved. But that corporation goes under just recently owing $357,000 in back payroll taxes. Oh, you know where they come to collect. They come to the deep pocket, Dr. Daddy, Los Angeles, and file a $357,000 tax lien against innocent 
daddy doctor. It is the relationships that often nail us in those things. Be careful. Somebody else can owe taxes, but you have to pay. You're an officer, a director of a corporation. You're involved in a partnership. You're a trustee of a trust. All kinds of situations. And I, and I don't know how to say this one tactfully, but I'll try as best I can. I'm sure that each one of you thoroughly trusts the income tax planning abilities of your spouse. You know full well that your spouse pays every penny of income taxes owed, reports every penny of income tax received, never takes any more deductions than that to which he or she is not entitled. But just in case that is not the situation, let me tell you what happened just the other day. A lady came into her office. She said, Jay, she said, I answered a knock on the door. She says it was an IRS agent. I invite the IRS agent in. The IRS agent comes in, sits down. I said, Mr. Brown, I just have one question to ask you, Mr. Brown. Were you married to Mr. Smith three and one half years ago? She said, well, yes, I was married to Mr. Smith three and a half years ago. Gee, I'm glad to get rid of that guy. The IRS agent smiles and said, Mrs. Brown, that will now be. $212,000 in back taxes and penalties you now owe for the income tax con artist evasion activities of your ex-husband, Mr. Smith. How do you care to pay? Your Visa card, your diner's card, your MasterCard. <laughs> hey, folks, she said, I almost fainted. Now, do you know what her mistake was? Does anybody know what her mistake was? Okay, so I, thank you. Somebody <laughs> says uh, she married the guy. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to mistake number two. What is the second mistake she perhaps made? Anybody know? Now I'm hearing rumblings all over which says she filed a joint tax return. And when you file that joint tax return, you now become jointly, severally, solely, and individually liable for those taxes of that spouse. So be careful there. Oh, incidentally, those of you, although they may be few, who are in that kind of situation, you might want to consider filing what? Does anybody know? Yeah, I hear the words. Separate ta tax returns. Okay. Okay. Let's go now to point number two. Point number two. This is another major, major income tax mistake, I think, in America. And that is we fail to convert to the corporate form of doing business sooner. We run around as a business trust, as a land trust, as a proprietorship, as a partnership. And we fail to move to the corporate form of doing business let me show you one of the intriguing things that you must be aware of when you set up a corporation. We'll now show you on the screen just an incredible concept. I want you to get this one down. Amongst tax attorneys and tax accountants nationally, there are two major secrets in income tax planning. Two major ones. Now, point number one is this. There are approximately 20 major unique tax deductions if you use a corporation, particularly if the corporation is known as the C, as opposed to what is known as the S or used to be called the Subchapter S Corporation. You must sit down with your tax attorney and your accountant and they will discuss with you some fun things. For example, as income flows into that corporation, you might take some of it out down here in so many different fun tax deductible ways it just blows your mind as an example. I have three doctors in Southern California who have each prescribed swimming pools to the other. Now I know that sounds shammy, but I would defend those three doctors to the United States Supreme Court. Well, I defend two of them to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, let me tell you why. There's a little section of the Internal Revenue Code, section 105. Incredibly important little section, which basically, if you have a medical reimbursement plan drafted within the walls of your corporation, you now write off medical bills, dental bills, orthodontic bills. It is an incredibly important tool, and your attorney can draft it into the corporation, often, often with just one page, sometimes two pages. Section 79 of the Internal Revenue Code deals with life insurance, the ways that that can be deductible. Look. See your attorney, see your accountant, and say, will you please review with me the 20 great income tax benefits I can get by using my corporation? Now let me move you to secret number two. Secret number two is called spread income. 
spread income. And on the right hand side of the screen in front of you, we've illustrated four major ways to spread income. Now the concept is this. There probably is not one of you here with us tonight in our three locations, not one of you. But what you could take from 10% to 90% of your income and shift it to other family members through certain kinds of legal tools and have the income taxable in the lower brackets of the family members and then you can do literally the ultimate which is they pay the income taxes at their low bracket but you mother and dad you keep all of the income their children's trust s corporations that are used but my favorite tool in america is right here it is called the limited partnership that is tool number six to which we will address more specific matters shortly so a limited partnership in fact the one you see right here is a very prominent businessman where I put the husband and wife in a limited partnership they own two percent the kids own as you see right here 98 percent that means that with one minor exception 98 percent of the income that flows into that family partnership is now taxable in the lower brackets of kids grandkids nieces nephews others yet mother and dad pay income taxes at on only 2% of the income, the mother and dad have 100% control of the income. This is governed by Section 704 of the Internal Revenue Code. It's one of the great white area of the law kinds of tools to be used in income spreading. Let us now move to overview number three. Let us now move into some estate planning situations. This is the third reason many of you here are here tonight. There are some basic estate planning problems that I'd like to address with you and have each of us discuss now for a few moments. Problem number one. Wills do not avoid probate. Do you realize what you have done so often all over America? Not just you, all over America. We run to our attorney and we say, attorney, I want my estate planning done. How soon can I have a will prepared? Folks, I wish we could purge that from the English language. When you go to your attorney, you say, attorney, I want my estate planning done. Will you now please discuss with me the two forms of wills used in America and the two forms of living trust? Will you discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the four techniques used in estate planning? Remember, folks, wills do not avoid probate. There has never been a will in the history of America that avoids probate. So if you want to avoid probate, consider an alternative. Incidentally, one of the alternatives is the trust that we have alluded to, which we'll get into in greater detail uh, shortly with you. Now, a second problem area. We've already talked about joint ownership. We've already talked about joint tenancy. We've talked about the danger of holding assets jointly between a husband and wife or between anyone else. Let me tell you, there is a very fatal mistake made frequently in estate planning, and that's this. Between a husband and wife, if your total estate exceeds $600,000, the rule in our law firm is you must immediately abandon all uses of joint ownership. You move into other tools. Joint ownership can be a catastrophe in estate planning. There is one other subtle thing. I've got to mention it to you a few years ago. I had a lady come to me. She said, Mr. Minton, I have my will all prepared. She said, would you mind just looking at the will, make sure that my properties go to my children as is outlined in the will. I looked at the will. The will stated the assets would go to her children. But then we had to dig deeper. We said, now I want to see the title to your assets. I want to see the deeds on your home. I want to see how the bank account signature card is set up. She said, well, why do you want to do that? My will passes all the assets to my kids. I said, ma'am, I must look at those assets. She came back a week later and brought with her the deeds to the home. She brought with her the bank account signature card. She brought with her her stocks and her bonds. And I was shocked because on all of those assets, she had listed her next door neighbor, a kindly gentleman with whom I'll impugn no ill motives on his part. He'd been a gentleman who had helped her in times of stress, helped her pay the bills, helped her do these kinds of things. And I think he was very honorable in what he tried to do. But do you now know that in every state in the United States, the general rule is if you use joint ownership, joint tenancy, your will is now 
legally invalid, technically invalid. In other words, no assets can flow through the will. Joint tenancy in almost every jurisdiction in America cancels out the will, supersedes the will, and the estate now goes not to this widow's children, it goes by operation of law to her next door neighbor. Be careful, folks. You cannot believe what is happening in America on that one. And just the other day came across my desk the first case in American history, of which I'm aware, where an attorney was held guilty of malpractice because he gave a client a will and then failed to check the deeds and how she or he held title to their assets. And when that client passed away, the estate went under the law of joint ownership and not under the will. The attorney, for the first time in history, as far as I know, is now held guilty of estate planning malpractice. Let's move to point number three. Point number three. Most living trusts do not avoid probate. That means many of you have set up your living trusts and you think everything is in order. You have your assets, some of which are conveyed to the trust. Let me give you the fatal mistake in America, and that's this. If you set up your living trust, but you fail to convey your assets into that living trust and a death occurs, Something else controls where those assets go and not the living trust, and you end up going through probate on those assets. The secret in living trusts is to fully fund the living trust. It's only all the assets that are in there at the date of death that will then go directly to the family without probate and perish the thought of the three-year rule. Congress wiped that out in 1981. So the three-year rule has no applicability. That means you can give assets away, you can put them in that living trust. In fact, I don't think there's a month go by. We don't go to the hospital sometime, and we're, you know, somebody's given 14 seconds to live. If we can get there with one second to go, and that person has just signed their trust with one second to go, that living trust totally and completely avoids the probate on the estate of that person. Let's now go to point number four, most living trusts have no lawsuit protection, and we've had one great testimonial already today from our audience who lost the assets in a lawsuit, for example, because they used a living trust. Now, let me tell you why. Most living trusts have no lawsuit protection because the assets are placed on the wrong, in the wrong side of the trust. Now, I'll show you how to handle that one in probably just 15 minutes or so. So the bottom line is this, be careful. Even though you, have, you, you see something that says trust on it, and you think you can trust a trust, you can trust a trust to do certain things, but you cannot trust most trusts to insulate your assets. Let's go to number five. Trusts and wills are not enough. I was so upset a few years ago because one of our local associations sent around a $300 living trust to every single member of that association. And those people thought they had their estate planning done. I had people come to me at $20,000 estates, $1 million estates, $5 million estates, $10 million estates. They all had the $300 living trust and they thought their estate planning was done. You must understand that the larger the estate, the greater become the number of tools that must, of necessity, be used if you wish to reduce, income to reduce the estate taxes and reduce the probate. Now let me give you the cutoff point. If you are single and your estate exceeds $600,000, as we demonstrate on point number six of our outline, you must go beyond. That means we must use other kinds of tools. We must use certain kinds of irrevocable trusts, certain kinds of limited partnerships, certain kinds of children's trusts. If you're married and your total estate exceeds $1.2 million, then to avoid the death taxes, the probate, you have to go beyond. There are other tools that are required. Folks, don't fall into that fatal trap of so many who think all they need is a will or a living trust and the estate planning is done. If you fall within those two categories, those two parameters, you must immediately consider with your attorney using additional tools. Let us now go to the next transparency, next screen. And I'm gonna demonstrate for you a very intriguing set of circumstances that we must often look at when it comes to estate planning. So let me now go through with you now five major tips in estate planning. So 
So here we go. Now, in your notes, you might just simply want to make a note. Here are the five highlights. Here are five agenda items I need to discuss with my attorney. Now, I'm going to use a larger estate here. Let me just oh, let me put on the screen an estate worth, let's say, $2 million. And let's say that you have life insurance worth, perhaps, of that $2 million, maybe $500,000. Step number one in estate planning is this. Now, you're going to be shocked when I show you this. And I hope you can at least, may not read it all, but at least you get the concept. This is known as the 706 estate tax form. 706. This thing must be filed within nine months of the date of death. That's page number one. This is 35 pages long, but the biggest shocker to most families in the estate planning field is the appropriately numbered IRS page number 13. Page number 13, a great big blank page on which you and I now list down the most heavily taxed asset in America and some of you are going to say, oh, that must be the pension plan, it must be the home. The most heavily taxed asset in America, the IRS gives you the whole page to be sure you can write down all that you have of that particular asset. That asset is the very thing many of you have been lied to repeatedly, not intentionally lied to, but negligently lied to. You have been told time and time again, buy more of this asset because it goes tax-free to your family. Folks, you buy more of it and then it becomes often the number one source of revenue to the Internal Revenue Service as high as, as I mentioned, 40% each year. That asset, your life insurance. Oh, and I, saw, I know some of you are going to say, hey, Jay, I just talked to my insurance advisor the other day. He assured me that life insurance goes tax-free. It does and it does not. Section 101 of the Internal Revenue Code basically says there shall be imposed no federal income taxes on proceeds of life insurance as long as you don't violate the transfer for value rule, which most of you won't violate. But Section 2042 of the Internal Revenue Code is the culprit, not Section 101. Section 2042 says, notwithstanding 101, there shall hereby be levied federal estate taxes in an amount not to exceed 55% on insurance proceeds of the five secrets, the five tips. Number one, consider transferring the insurance so it goes tax-free to the family. There are two ways to do it. Number one, you can make your children the owners and beneficiaries of your life insurance, and that avoids the debt taxes on the life insurance. Number two, you can transfer your insurance to an irrevocable trust. You transfer that insurance to an irrevocable trust, one of the great secrets in America. Now let's go to point number two, gifting. In larger estates, by that I mean if you're married, you're over 1.2 million, you're single, you're under 600,000, you may want to gift. Now you know how much can be given away. Basically you can give 20,000 away, 40,000 away if you're gifting to a married child. In other words, each one of us here tonight can give $10,000 to each person, as many people as we would like, and it goes tax free. But let me give you the secret. The secret in gifting is this, folks. If you're going to share assets with your children, your grandchildren, nieces, and nephews, aunts, uncles, you're going to share those assets. I tell my clients, you give, you give the family the yo-yo, but you better keep the string, the string of control. You use that string of control. And incidentally, the greatest legal tool in America is called the Family Limited Partnership, that is tool. Number six, that will be two shortly. Okay, number three. The third point in estate planning is to consider dividing the assets equally between the husband and between the wife. And that, in fact, most estate planning textbooks recommend you put half the assets in the husband's name, half the assets in the wife's name. But let me say quickly before you write that fully down that with most of my clients, I will not allow them to do that because if you have one spouse who is more vulnerable to lawsuits and litigation than is the other spouse, Often, you'll shift the assets somewhere else. Take me in Jay Mitten's situation. I will have more assets right here inside of perhaps my wife's name, my wife's trust, other things owned by my wife. I'll have more with my children. So that is the exception where one spouse is more vulnerable to litigation or lawsuits by his or her past or present business or professional activities. Then you must consider perhaps shifting more assets to the less vulnerable spouse or trust 
or to the children. And step number four in estate planning is to use the A and the B trust. You've got to talk to your attorneys about that. The A trust is called the marital trust. But the B trust is known as the bypass trust, credit trust, shell trust, exemption equivalent trust. You've got a thousand names for it. But talk to your attorney about the need to implement the A and the B trust. And now we move you to the fifth point in estate planning, the fifth tip, as we look at the following screen. We're going to be discussing on the next screen the four major tools used in America in estate planning. Now I want you to look at this thing carefully because this is really not well understood. So here are the four most frequently used tools in estate planning, and I'm going to, I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb tonight to suggest that each one of you here tonight who has your estate planning done has one of these tools. This is what you have. Basically, every will ever written says, when I die, now do you see these little assets right here? It says, when I die, I hereby bequeath those assets to my attorney to now take into probate for me. The will sends the assets immediately into probate. Wills do not avoid probate. Now there is an advantage of wills. There are disadvantages. You discuss those with your advisors. The advantage, incidentally, as I mentioned earlier, wills are relatively inexpensive to set up now, but they cost the family later when you go through probate. There is a very popular will. That's column two over here. That is a will that has a trust inside of it. That one basically says, when I die, my assets will go into probate. And then it says, after the probate process is finished, the assets will now remain under the supervision of a trustee named inside the trust. Often, often the bank trust department can be the attorney, can be a member of the family. Not well understood. Number three, there's also a very rare trust demonstrated by column three, but an even rarer trust demonstrated in column four. Now let's take column four first. This is the fully funded trust, the rarest trust in the United States. That's where you set up a living trust now during your lifetime. You put your home, you put your bank accounts, you put your stocks, you put your bonds, you put your assets inside of that trust. And if you have all of your assets inside of that trust and a death occurs, the estate goes instantly to the family. There is no probate, no tie up with the assets. That is the rarest living trust in America. The most popular the most frequently used trust in America is a living trust into which you often place perhaps $25 or an insurance policy. And then you have what is known as a pour over will. Now this is column three. That means that you only avoid probate on the $25. And the rest of the assets typically go marching through probate and are then poured over into that trust. Those are the four systems. We have now completed our overview of three major subjects. You have in your notes a bunch of tips on lawsuit planning and solutions. You have in your notes some income tax planning tips. You have in your notes some estate planning tips. Now we're going to move to the six major legal tools used in America. And if you have not taken a lot of notes to this point in time, let me suggest take copious notes from this point on. Because I'll bet there's not one person tonight in our three audiences, not one of you tonight, but what you need two of these tools. Some of you three of these tools. Some of you may even need four of these tools. So take good notes. Here are those six tools that we will now discuss. Irrevocable trust, children's trust, corporations, limited partnerships, living trust, business trust, these are the six. Now I'm going to start now with this one. We're going to start with the fully funded living trust. This was the column four we talked about a moment. And let us now move to the screen dealing with funding a trust. Now I want you to look carefully. Look carefully at that living trust as I dissect it for you. As we go through the component parts of a living trust, as our one question was raised at the beginning of this meeting, why did somebody lose assets inside of their trust? You listen to the next five or six minutes, you will know quickly why he or she lost those assets. Living trusts have been around, incidentally, since 16 AD. These are nothing new on this scene. They are governed by section 671 of the Internal Revenue Code. 
These are in the white area of the law. They are gorgeous tools. Now, my own situation, let me just share with you how I have done it in my own estate. In my own estate, J. Mittens, revocable trust, I have a car. I have a truss or a truck inside of my living trust. Incidentally, I also have five other small items in my living trust. But notice in my wife's trust, now notice this. In my wife's trust, I have the home. I have some bank accounts, I have some stocks. In fact, five of the biggest things that she and I own are in my wife's living trust, and you're gonna say, now why? I remember there are two reasons. You use living trusts, you use them in estate planning, you use them in lawsuit protection. Now watch carefully. When you set up the living trusts, you must fund the trust. Therein is one of the big mistakes in America. We set up a living trust, but it is a dry, it's an empty trust. We don't have the assets conveyed inside of the trust. We must consider putting those assets into that living trust, and we do it now. Before death occurs, that's how you avoid probate. Now watch. If all the assets are inside this funded living trust that you have now set up, now, remember, now funding, I've got to mention this to you. The word funding may trip some of you up. Funding means to convey. It means to transfer into the trust your assets. There are only two ways since 16 AD, in every state in the United States, this is the law, only two ways to transfer assets to the trust. Number one is title, number two, Schedule A. Now title means, well, let me give you an example. On my wife's trust, it would say the Joan Mitten Living Trust. The bank accounts, the home, those kinds of things. Now the Schedule A is the second way to transfer assets into the trust. Schedule A means you just take a little schedule, attach it to the wife's trust, list her assets on that Schedule A. Then you take another Schedule A, list the husband's assets on that particular Schedule A, and that's how you fund his trust. Those are the two major ways, and the only two, literally, that can be used effectively in the United States to transfer assets into the trust. Now are you with me? A funded trust means all your funds, all your properties are inside that trust. I put everything in. I even put statements saying the personal property, including the television set, the silverware, is inside of the trust. I do not want my clients going through probate, even on the television, the personal property, the haystack, which we have seen all over America, people doing. Those two words make a big difference. Okay, now let's assume you have all the assets inside of mother and dad's trust. Now watch what happens from an estate planning standpoint. The estate of the husband and wife instantly goes down to the widow, the widower, and notice, as this diagram shows, there's no probate. There are no estate taxes, if you've used correctly the A and B trust, I mean zero, zero, zero. That is the white area of the law. Now notice though that when the widow or widower passes away, mother and dad both pass away, the estate now moves to the children. Once again, no probate. And no estate taxes up to 1.2 million dollars. There you have the estate planning advantage of the living trust. Now hang on, for your notes, remember, there's this another reason you look at the living trust, and that's the lawsuit protection, and let me give you this. In fact, this is one of the most frequently filed up things in America. You cannot believe how many business people, professionals come to me, and they say, Jay, I'm a doctor, I'm a businessman, and because I'm vulnerable to lawsuits, I have placed all my assets inside my wife's name. That is fatal. That is so bad, I will allow no client in any state in the United States to ever put assets into the name of the other spouse because the courts generally come along and say, Dr. Daddy, your creditors may seize the assets in your wife's name because you violated the Fraudulent Conveyances Act when you transferred the assets to your wife in her name. And then they say often through the court holdings that the wife is nothing but a constructive trustee for the benefit of the husband, and hence the husband's creditor sees the assets in the wife's name. Fatal. Never do you put assets, at least from my standpoint, in the name of your spouse. A living trust is governed by a whole different set of rules. Now, the, from a lawsuit standpoint, if Jay Minton gets sued, I am vulnerable. You know, as a tax attorney, as an accountant, I'm vulnerable. If I get sued, the law in every state in the United States basically is this. If I have transferred my assets into my wife's trust with two conditions precedent, then the creditors may not seize the assets in my wife's trust. Those two conditions in every state in the United States, with the third condition being added in other states, which are not here present tonight. But the two conditions are number one. You must correctly transfer the assets to the trust. That means the title. It means the Schedule A. Those are the two ways. And number two, you must 
timely transfer those assets in. Time is a factor. Now, I hate to be the bearer of bad tactics, but for attorneys and accountants in their seminars. The time frame is governed by what is known as the Fraudulent Conveyances Act. In fact, the statute, limit, uh, statute limitations period that governs that. That ranges from a low of two years in Texas to the state with the longest time frame in America, and hence the worst state in America from the standpoint of the statute limitations. Oh, that state? Missouri. Missouri, as far as 10 years. So are you with me? To gain the protection, the general rule, the longer the assets are in that trust, the better. Incidentally, what about Portland? What about Salt Lake City? The time frame is four years in those, in those states, those jurisdictions. Now let me summarize for you the living trust. Okay, the two reasons on our next screen, if you'll make note of this. In summary, the two ways, the two concepts, the two reasons, the two critically important reasons that you must use that trust, number one now, Remember, you use it in estate planning. You use it to avoid debt taxes. You use it to avoid probate. And number two, you use it in lawsuit protection if it is set up correctly. So the general rule, assets in the wife's trust may not be reached by the husband's creditors if those two conditions I cited a moment ago have been met. And now we introduce you to a very, very important screen which summarizes what we have done to this moment in time. I want you to look in the lower left-hand side. That is the revocable trust. Now, I'm going to introduce you to you one of the most dangerous concepts in America. I don't want you to ever forget it. And that's this. It is called the spoiled apple principle. Now, the spoiled apple principle means this. I tell my clients, don't you dare ever in your lifetime place all of your assets into any one legal tool. I do not care the name of that tool. You never place all your assets in the living trust, into joint ownership, offshore trust, treaty trust, Isle of Man trust, irrevocable trust, S corporation, C corporation, 2503C trust, 2503B trust. You never place all the assets into any one legal tool, no matter what the name is. It is wrong, in my opinion. Absolutely, unequivocally wrong. Now, I'm going to refer to this repeatedly through the meeting. The spoiled apple principle. Oh. Watch what happened the other day in Washington, D.C. A gentleman came up to me. He said, Jay, I've attended a several seminars on estate planning, on living trust. He said, Jay, I went home. I set up a living trust. Now watch what he did. He placed all of his assets into the living trust. But notice this little darkening mark I'm making for you in the wife's and the husband's trust. That is their living trust, the one we just talked about. This gentleman said, Jay, he said, I placed all my assets into that living trust. He said, we were thrilled. Our state's in order. I mean, you, you know, naturally, you know, I thought you could trust a trust type thing. Then he said this. He said, Jay, that little asset that I've diagrammed for you right here on the screen. He said, Jay, that is a little rental home that I own in the Washington, D.C. area, the greater area, Washington, D.C. He said, I rent that home to a grandmother for $250 per month. He said the other day, Grandson comes over to get, visit grandmother, and the grandson immediately begins nibbling on the lead-based painted walls. The grandson tragically gets very ill, has some permanent side effects. It is very tragic. In fact, it's tragic from both sides that we're now going to talk about. The parents of the grandson immediately file suit for $5 million against this gentleman. And oh, incidentally, notice. They filed a $5 million lawsuit against not only the gentleman talking to me, but also against his living trust. He said, Jay, I ran to my insurance company. I said, insurance company. I'm now being sued. He said, I'm so grateful I've made these malpractice and liability premium payments to you over the years. I'm grateful I've got this insurance. And the insurance company said to him, oh, you haven't read the policy? He said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm sorry, but most insurance companies have an exception for lead-based painted poisoning situations. We're sorry, but you're on your own. He said, Jay, I am now defending myself in a $5 million lawsuit without insurance. His fatal mistake, folks, his fatal mistake is this. He transferred all of his assets into one legal tool, and now it looks as though all of those assets inside the living trust may now be lost. Do you remember the point? 
You never place all of your assets, never, into any one legal tool. I do not care the name of the legal tool to me. It is one of the biggest mistakes in America. Now, some of you are going to say, Jay, what should he have done? What could he have done to have insulated, to have protected himself? What are some things he, he might have done differently? Answer. If this gentleman in Washington, D.C., instead of placing all of his assets into that one living trust, if he had transferred those assets into multiple tool number sixes, which we're moving to shortly, it would have been a different result. And this gentleman would no longer be in danger of losing everything that he has spent a lifetime accumulating. Now, we've covered with you tool number one. We now have we now have five other major tools that we are going to focus in with you on. Now, we've got about two minutes before intermission time. Do any of you have any quick questions, which I will now repeat. We've covered a lot of material. Do you have any quick questions here that I can now beam out for two quick minutes? Any questions on any subject, raise your hands. We'll go at them. Yes, ma'am. Just side and I'll repeat it. The question is, what was that last thing I transferred into? In other words, what is that tool number six? The answer, it is a limited partnership, and we must use many limited partnerships. So hang on, you'll see that we must use multiple limited partnerships. Any other quick questions, which will help our other audiences in Portland and Kansas City also? Yes, sir. Quick question. Now, what is tip number two of the five quick tips? One was children's beneficiary, three was distribution of assets, four was the AP, five of the different forms of wills and trust. Okay, come and see me at the break. We'll go over those five. We'll five those five tips, okay, in the estate. I just want to summarize the five tips. They're in your notes. In fact, look in your handout sheet. I think they're written in there, okay? Now, question for Portland. Portland, do you have a question for us? Can you be your own trustee of an irrevocable trust? Okay, good question. The answer is you can be your own trustee of a revocable living trust. It's done all over America, but you better not be the trustee of an irrevocable trust. If you are the trustee of an irrevocable trust, then life insurance will be imputed back to you and taxed to you. And number two, if a lawsuit strikes, you can be nailed. Okay, question from Kansas City now. Do you have a question? Yes, I want to go back to um, lawsuits in your solutions number two. Um, I'm in a group of seven cardiopulmonary perfusionists, and we have a blanket malpractice insurance. I want to know that if one person makes a mistake and it, it is critical to a patient, would we all be liable under that insurance? The rule is this. If something goes wrong by one of you or by the association itself, they nail all of us because we're in a joint venture, we're in a quasi-partnership. That means you've got to have, number one, plenty of insurance. Number two, you better have structured that business correctly, such as normally a corporation. And number three, you better have protected your personal assets, your personal insulation through the living trust, limited partnerships. Pay particular attention to tool number six that we're going to discuss after the break. It may literally be the most important tool in your entire, entire financial lifetime. We will now, folks, move into the break. And as we go to the break, I want you to think of added questions that you may now have. And we will discuss those questions after the break. So write them down, and we'll see you in a few moments. OK, thank you, Jay. That was great. Are you getting all this information down? There's a lot to learn, isn't there? I took several pages of notes myself. Jay has given us most of the protected tools this past hour. And next he's going to show us how to structure those tools together. He feels that's going to be the most critical part of tonight's program. Possibly even the most critical part of your financial career. I guess the most striking thought I've had during this past hour has been the extreme importance of covering yourself from every angle. Of course, there are the obvious ones, but I hadn't even thought of being sued for acting as an implied corporate officer. You could lose everything just by signing a check. And there's so many traps out there, I don't think we realize just how vulnerable we actually are. After listening to Jay Mitten this past hour, do you feel a real need to become better educated on how to protect yourself and your assets? If you do, I think you'll want to listen very closely to this. Satellite Network Affiliates is pleased to present a very special package offer. Tonight only, the complete J. Mitten Financial Protection Package will be available at a significant savings to you just for attending tonight's seminar. 
You've spent a lifetime accumulating your assets. Why not spend some time and money protecting them against loss? Jay Mitten has created the most detailed and useful financial guides available, and now you can get these guides for a fraction of their regular price. This seminar package includes Jay's newest book, Creating Your Financial Fortress, a book which at least 10 national newsletters, including the Wall Street Digest, highly recommend to their readers. This 200-page guide contains valuable solutions to the major financial problems today, teaching you five ways you can keep your home if you're sued how you can control 100% of the family assets following a divorce, four proven alternatives to costly malpractice and liability insurance, and so much more. It's the only financial guide which teaches you how to protect yourself after a lawsuit has commenced or been threatened. Creating Your Financial Fortress is accompanied by an eight-tape audio cassette album called The Total Financial Protection Plan. These tapes contain over seven hours of instruction on lawsuit planning, asset protection, income tax planning, and advanced estate planning. You'll learn about the rarest limited partnership in America and about the latest living trust being used in Jay Mitten's law firm. The tapes also teach you about business trusts, corporations, and many other financial strategies. In addition to the audio tape album, this package includes a 66-page asset protection guidebook which can help you plan a simple estate as well as a very complex one. It also includes an estimated ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of legal forms and information in two deluxe Creating Your Financial Fortress volumes. Many people choose to complete the simple forms in these volumes themselves and then give them to their attorneys for review. Well, if you order this package tonight, Jay Mitten's law firm will provide 90 days of free legal consultation to answer your attorney's questions. That means you're getting thousands of dollars in legal services for the price of this financial protection package. This package would normally retail for $955, but it's available to you tonight through the seminar link for only $395. That's a savings of $560. This package is easy to order. Simply complete the product order form in your seminar packet and return it to the product display area in the lobby. There, you'll get a copy of the order receipt for your records and you'll see the materials you're buying. Your products will be shipped UPS within four to six days and come with an unconditional satisfaction guarantee. If for any reason you are dissatisfied with these quality J. Mitten products, simply call the toll-free SNA customer hotline and arrange for a complete exchange or refund. This incredible seminar link offer is available tonight only through satellite network affiliates. Don't be caught unprepared. Take advantage of this invaluable opportunity to let Jay Mitten help you protect and make the most of your financial future. Be sure to...